Tuesday and Wednesday and was so sick when I returned from Oslo that they sent me directly to the hospital and I had something that hurts a lot it's called Inis that hurts a lot <laughs> so I stayed on the hospital for five days but now I'm back again fit for fight and all the lectures that we have missed you will have them later on okay that's our contract is that we is that screen on hmm? turn it on. okay then this is the important lecture three basics chapter three first one and <coughs> now we are going to deal with what's meant with competition this is a very very important lecture it's not easy to understand this one it is very very difficult to understand it in depth many of you have learned it over and over and over again I just have to study it and each time that I teach on this topic I just feel that this is a very very beautiful one it's beautiful so in this chapter we will deal with two models competition and monopoly that is where we have no strategic interactions in this course the main topic will be where we have strategic interactions but to benchmark and to understand the two extremes competition monopoly we need these two models when we start to model the more complex markets where we have strategic interactions where we are going to use game theory and these are simple models and but even though they are simple they are so complex and to really prove this model scientifically it is a very very complex model but in your world you will have the experience that we deal with a simple model that serve as a reference point for a more complex market model and as I've told you before in the textbook you have the US examples I will not use the US example when I teach over perfect competition my examples will be the Norwegian most important industrial sector and just to remind you hydropower the electricity market in Norway is very close to a perfect competitive market it's organized as a perfect competitive market and the prices will be decided every day and I can go to the newspaper every day and see that demand and supply will just decide the price level of electricity every day they meet in the marketplace all the sellers and all the buyers selling and buying electricity and in this market you have a very close to perfect competitive market because it's a homogeneous product electricity is electricity is electricity and we have hydro we export the electricity and that means that we need we meet with the prices in the export market so we export 
when the price level is higher than inside Norway and we sell to Norwegian consumers when the price level in Norway is higher than to export. So this is one complex market and it's a complex model when we model this topic within the concept of game theory and industrial organization but still we will keep it quite simple supply and demand and now and then <coughs> the Norwegians will feel that the larger supplier called Stoutkraft has market power and that's when they increase prices to some extent to increase profit and when does that happen? That does happen when just after the summer if the price level in the international market will be high Startkraft will export what does that mean? that in these <coughs> where they store the water they just reduce the water level export electricity to a high price outside Norway they gain a high profit and what happens? if it doesn't rain today it's raining hooray <laughs> and why? when it's raining all the Norwegians will know that it's during the winter the electricity prices will be low because it's raining it's filling up all the dams where we have storing storage of water and if it doesn't rain too much and if we have a cold winter if it's cold we use electricity for heating and if Startkraft has exported a lot because of high, uh, high export prices then we always say that hmm now in this winter the prices are much too high and the market doesn't work we say and over and over and over and over again there will be an expert within industrial organization to analyze it see if there will be any sort of market power and they will come out with a report telling the public that it does work. This is close to perfect competition. It just looks like that they did export too much, but since they exported a lot, they cannot just predict how much rain will come. <laughs> that is unpredictable. And they cannot predict how cold it will be in winter time. That is also unpredictable. But still, the market works. We are the only country in the world that have really deregulated our electricity market where we have a perfect competitive market that really works. And this strange country where we say that we regulate most of our economy, not in this field. Here we believe in the market. Here we mean that the market is very efficient to put on the right prices and to invest exactly at the level where the willingness to pay just cover the long term marginal cost as will be the main topic today this is a very interesting marketplace and there will be no such thing as strategic interactions. What you can say is that there are players that will play against nature. That's what we're going to learn too. Play against nature. That is to play against how much rain will it come? How cold will it be? But still it is to a great 
just close to perfect competitive market. So every time when the textbooks say that this market doesn't exist, I remind you, yes, they do. I don't like the textbook in this field. The Norwegian electricity market is a very, very good example of where we use the marketplace for efficient allocation. But just to remind you, who is the owner of these hydropower plants? Mm, mm, mm. Who is the owner? Is it the private sector? It is a lot of small communities, but public municipalities and stately owned companies. And there are many players, owners, but they're all public companies owned by the people. But many players, they will sell and the people will buy. So there is sellers and buyers, but no such things at private companies. But these public companies, they will maximize profit. They just maximize profit. They sell to the highest price possible, earn a lot of money, and where do you think the money will end up? <laughs> to cover public expenses. So when the municipalities pay for the teachers, pay for the nurses, those that will be owners of hydropower have this extra tax income, so to call it, that comes from owning a hydropower plant. But they just act as private companies. Maximize profit. This is a good example. And I will come back to that, maybe also in the exam. Because this example in Norway, and this sector in Norway, is a very big one. And it's very important in the new Indian economy. And this is one resource that makes us rich. Hydropower. And then, my next example. What do you think about um, fish farming? Mm. We have a lot of fish farming companies spread all along the Norwegian coastline. Many sellers. Do you believe that there are many buyers? No? Many buyers. And what happens when you have many sellers and many buyers? Perfect competition. Mm -hmm. We export the salmon. We export the trout. We send it to France and we sent it to Russia. <laughs> but no problem, just to switch to other countries. We send it to China and we send it to US. We just export it. And we earn a lot of money. Each year we export salmon and trout for the amount of 30 billion Norwegian kroners. I say it once more. 30 billion Norwegian kroners. And they just act within the concept of a perfect competitive model. Sellers and mass. What about the feeding industry? Because 60% of the cost for the fish farming industry will be feed. What about the feeding industry? Is that the perfect competitive system? No. Why come? There are only three big players. One, two, three. So, the input feed is where we have three players and they play over quantity in the Konoge. And you'll meet this example when we come 
to the Konoge. That's when we have three players, they play over quantity, they maximize profit, and we have strategic interaction in the feeding industry. But not in fish farming. That's where we have a perfect competitive system. So, what about aluminium? We produce a lot of aluminium. I think each year we export for approximately the same as, uh, as for fish farming, uh, in between 30 and, and 40 billion Norwegian kroners is the exportation of aluminium. Is that a perfect competitive system? Do you think aluminium is a homogeneous product? Yes. Huh? Homogeneous product. Do you think there are many players? Many sellers? Yes. We have Hydro, Norsk Hydro. That's a big one. In US they have Alcoa. And what is the name of the aluminium producers in China? Have you any names from China? producing aluminium. Do you remember any in China? Producing aluminium. <laughs> there are many, there are many companies there in China competing with the Norwegian companies. So again, we have many centers. Huh? Do you think we have many buyers? All the car industry will buy aluminium. And then, when we have many centers, many buyers, and we export all our aluminium to a world market, that's a perfect competitive market. So why come the textbook say that this market doesn't exist. For the Norwegian economy, it exists. And we act just according to an international perfect competitive system. But the US economy, they just tell us that this is where we have perfect competition. It isn't. Norway has perfect competition. <laughs> Here's where we combine the good part of perfect competition and regulation. So we use the market where it works. We regulate just to have control, especially concerning distribution of income. So we believe in the market, but to remind you, we don't believe in the financial market. That's where we regulate. And that's where US believe in efficiency. We don't. We don't. But we believe in the marketplace for electricity, for fish farming, for aluminium. What about oil? <laughs> what about oil? Do you think there are many sellers? Do you think there are many buyers? Do you think anybody has market power? For the time being, OPEC has none. They are too small. So OK, OPEC is a cartel that doesn't influence the market for the time being. So, the very important oil market is that we need a perfect competitive system. Yes. Yes. Once more, we export everything that we can explore from the North Sea and further north. Everything is exported. And <coughs> Do you think the oil prices will be decided on the world market? And I look into the paper every day. 
what will be the price today? Decided by demand and supply. Demand and supply. And if for some reason China suddenly will stop importing oil, the prices will fall. And if US for some reason will start to develop these new unco un unconventional oil fields and expand dramatically, the prices might fall. But then they just have to follow the long term margin cost curve. And that's it, the example that you are going to learn today how the world market for oil will be close to a perfect competitive system and for the time being all the, the experts analyzing this market will end up saying that the prices is for the time being not driven by the demand side from China but it's driven from the cost side in US and that is what will be the cost to develop the margin field for unconventional oil in US. And if that is expensive, and it is, it's very costly to develop these new oil fields, these unconventional new technology oil, oil fields, quite expensive to develop them. And because of that, the long run marginal cost will tell us that the prices will be high. And we can just sit there, be relaxed, and our only threat will be if <coughs> there will be a brand new technology that will push the long run marginal cost to develop new <coughs> oil fields down to 60 70 dollars a barrel if that happens a new technology that is a problem for the new oil fields offshore in Norway especially those far north because they are costly to develop but still we are going to see that we will export oil and gas probably 50, 100 years within the into the future. That's my prognosis. Because it's so expensive to develop new oil fields. What about gas? Have you heard about delivery of Norwegian gas to Europe. Do you think this is a competitive market? Yes or no? <laughs> it is a rather complex market. And I once worked within an oil company and I took part in the negotiation when we negotiated the gas from the Tron platform that is the big platform in Norway and we negotiated a contract in 1988 and 87 and then I just left this institution worked in the research division within a company called Saga and they gave me a place where I just could take part in the way they developed the contract. So, so some economists would say that this is not a perfect competitive system. I know that these contracts are long-term contracts but every time when they are renegotiated Do you know what they look on? What they have to look to? 
that there is a short-term market of gas where demand and supply will decide the prices and when they renegotiate the price in the long-term contract can you just guess which price uh, uh. will be the final price in the negotiations? The proper market price? Proper market price? So there are contracts, but every time, every time they renegotiate them, they end up with a price just as within perfect competition. So, again, we are familiar with perfect competition dominating the Norwegian most important sector. Electricity. Yeah? Where Norwegians uh, export gas to Europe? Yeah? We export a lot of gas to Europe, mm -hmm. and the prices now are moving downwards. And do you know why? Because of the market forces, demand and supply. And U.S. is just upon to invest in LNG because they have a kind of surplus of, uh, of gas they want to export. But when they invest in LNG plant, that is expensive. Hmm. And when they transport it with LNG and tankers from US to Europe, that is expensive. And again, the long run margin cost will be the price that will give us the margin cost for US to export their gas as LNG to Europe. That would be the market price in the long run, decided by the market forces, demand and supply, but this time driven by the supply side. And why will I be so sure that there will be a demand? What about the gas from Ukraine? and Russia. <laughs> In this winter, that will be uncertain supply because of the conflict in Ukraine. The Russian can threaten just to reduce their delivery of gas. What about Norwegian gas then? <laughs> the prices, because of supply and demand, will move upwards. So if, if it will be a cold winter, in Europe, and if we were in conflict still with Ukraine, we will just sit there having a very high gas price decided by supply and demand. And again, we will be richer and richer and richer and richer. Do we need it? <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't need it. So, in the long run, gas is a winner. But the market will be decided by a proper, perfect competitive system. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> so, this was my introduction, so that you are familiar with the Norwegian examples and I return back to those examples over and over and over and over and over and over again because I will not use the US example but this text in the US textbook is just chapter 3 it's just wonderful it's so elegantly written that every morning this morning when I prepared for this lecture reading that chapter I just say wow uh, uh. nobody can write it more perfect than this but the examples they use stupid the 
examples are stupid. But the model is elegant. Read it. And in your hand, think of the Norwegian examples. Think of the Norwegian examples. And <coughs> we are also going to learn some welfare theory. We are going to go through monopoly market and market power briefly compare them and just briefly comment on antitrust policy US is very very focused on that I'm not not in this course so don't read too much of this antitrust policy it's important in Norway too to have an antitrust body an agent dealing with market power but we have much stronger regulations in our system to deal with market imperfection we look for market imperfection in US they look for <laughs> perfect markets this was the first picture <laughs> and I think I have 20 next one what are the assumptions concerning perfect competition and this is important first we need to have a large number of buyers and sellers and I've already told you in my five examples Second, the product must be homogeneous and electricity, aluminium, oil, gas, fish farm, salmon are close to homogeneous products. There are some variations concerning salmon. Some of the firms might succeed to develop a high quality salmon product and we will just deal with that later on but it's close to homogeneous and this bullet point number three perfect information that is important because for the market to work you need to have sellers and buyers that will be able to capture enough information to make the market work you need to know where you can buy the product cheapest you need to know how to reduce it most cost efficient you need to know how to minimize the input cost so there is a lot of information that you need to gather that you need to have available to conclude that we have a perfect competitive system but in my example we have one about the financial market do you think they have enough information? why not? When I go to the bank to negotiate a contract, do you think I will be attractive? All right. And if I ask for a loan, I will have the lowest interest rate that they can offer. They compete to have me as the customer. What about if you have a low salary? If you go to the bank with a low salary, and since you have a high debt and a low salary, you need to have even more of a loan to survive. What will the bank tell you? 
you are not attractive for any other banks, so I will have a very high interest rate because you cannot go to anybody else and negotiate. I can. What will the interest be for that fool? No. Very high. Is that fair? No. I don't know. And why don't we regulate the financial system that have so much power? In US they don't care. In England they don't care. But the biggest Norwegian bank, what will be the majority owner <laughs> in the biggest Norwegian bank? The state. The state. So they will just have to tell them, you have to consider that people need to have known, but still they have perverse incentives. They have what I call perverse incentives. Perverse incentives. So they also, for a stately owned bank, will end up to act exactly in that immoral way to put the interest rate high for the poor and no for me. I don't accept that. I don't accept that. Are you ready for a break? <laughs> then stop the camera. <laughs>